This episode is brought to you by the Innovative Leadership Institute, working with companies that recognize the need to upskill their leaders and transform their organizations. We help executive teams prepare for accelerated uncertainty by creating the foresight needed to stay competitive and transforming organizations to become future ready. If you'd like to discuss how we can help prepare your organization for tomorrow, please visit InnovativeLeadership.com and click Contact Us. I'm Maureen Metcalf, your host for Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm also the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. Today, we welcome Dr. Jennifer Nash, an executive advisor, author, and leadership consultant. Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Maureen. I'm so excited to talk about human leadership today and share this important message with your listeners. Can you briefly talk about human leadership and what it means and why it's so important in today's world? Human leadership today is so important because as we've seen with COVID, it really brought the human element to the forefront in our workplaces in a way that it hadn't done before. And so leaders need some new tools to help them figure out how do they lead when they're leading people as opposed to leading profit or leading performance or leading productivity or leading process. The tools are different when you lead different things. And I think what happened during COVID was leaders found their toolkits were a little bit empty when it came to how do I actually lead these people in front of me that are struggling with childcare and homeschooling and figuring out where their offices are going to be in their home because they don't have an extra office space. So looking at how we can take the entirety of the human being that is sitting in front of us and address them as that whole human being and look at how we can help them be their best human selves and ignite that internal motivation that they have will then in turn give us the outcomes that we're looking for in the workplace. It seems like such an important topic right now as we're exploring AI in the workplace too, that there is also the leading machines versus leading humans. This is going to become even more important as AI takes a bigger place in our workplace. Yeah. You know, it's interesting how AI is taking over certain things in the workplace, But I'm always curious about the limits of AI and the limits of where it could potentially go, as well as what are the possibilities and where is that sweet spot where we as human beings still have the opportunity to leverage that and make a difference and bring those uniquely human qualities that we have that can't be replicated by AI. That's such an important topic to me personally right now. You and I both are in front of leaders all the time, and some of them are really worried about where do I fit? I'm an attorney, and now the machines can do very well many of the things I did, or I'm an accountant, or I'm a physician. Helping human leaders understand how to lead humans, it seems like that's going to be the work of the leader in the next decade. As AI evolves, we still need humans to run organizations. It's interesting because there's going to be a set of skills that we need to lead the machines, if you will, right? And there's definitely a set of skills that we need to lead the people. And there's opportunity to grow in both of those spaces. And I think this isn't an either or question. I actually think it's an and question. Because at the end of the day, we also need people who can lead the organization with AI to go where it needs to go. And so that is a third kind of skill set. How do we integrate that and still move the organization in the direction that it needs to go? And I am not an AI expert, so I don't have the answers to that. But what I will say is that we have an opportunity now to start building some of those capabilities on the leading people side. So we can better understand how we need to integrate those AI pieces and lead holistically going forward. It is your expertise and my expertise and our listeners who will figure this out Mm -hmm. by leveraging strong human leadership skills. You know, the World Economic Forum highlighted many of the skills that are required for CEOs in the 2025 timeframe. And so many of them are around these human-centered skills, these people skills. And traditionally, they've been called soft skills. I don't like that term because it implies that there is something lesser of value about them or that there is something less valuable 
in a way about them as compared to the hard skills or the technical skills that people have often focused on. I think when we look to the future, I think there's an opportunity to talk about these set of skills that can help us lead the humans in our organizations that elevates those skills to an equal level as the technical skills, right? The ones that we rely on to be functionally proficient. And I like to say, like, we need to be technically proficient in human as well. What are some of these skills? Because I absolutely agree it's again a both. I have to know how to generate profit and I lead humans. I lead humans who accomplish the results. And we're looking at this epidemic of quiet quitting and disengagement and people actively disengaged and undermining our organizations. The level of engagement, I think, is at an all-time low, isn't it? It's very low, yes. If we're not acknowledging that we're missing the mark on how we lead humans, we are missing the solution to these challenges. I did a workshop recently where I was asking the participants, let's take a look at what you're leading. Because oftentimes people say, oh, yes, you know, I'm a leader. I lead people, right? Well, leaders lead people. That's what they do. Well, really? Do they? So we did a little study on what is it that you're leading? And it turns out that many of the leaders in the room They thought they were leading people, but what they ended up leading was a new process or a new procedure or profitability towards that end goal that the organization had identified or procedures to determine how to do something quicker, more efficiently, sort of that tailored approach to, you know, maximizing efficiency and improving how we do things in the workplace. We sat back for a moment after we saw the results of that and we said, well, why is that happening? And what can we do to refocus? Because when you think about leading, if you think about leading people as the goal, then the profits and the profitability and all of those metrics that you're looking for for the organizational success, those become the outcome. And so what if you flip that equation around and you lead people to drive that outcome rather than driving the outcome through people? So you mentioned, you know, what are some of those skills that we can do to do that? Well, I talk about some of those in my book. If you look at the World Economic Forum, they've got empathy listed. We know that that's a key characteristic of effective leadership. We've known that for a long time from leadership research, compassion, kindness. In my book, I talk about how do you help people feel heard? How do you help people feel understood? How do you help people feel that they matter? There was a study that was done in Sweden called the Wolf Study, where they looked to see the incidences of heart attack and disease and stroke, particularly in male employees. And for employees who did not feel appreciated by their bosses, the incidence of heart attack and stroke was 50% higher, especially for the male employees. That is a massive number. And I, I could not believe that when I saw that study because I just thought, wow, is there really that much impact when people do not feel appreciated at work. And when we saw the great resignation, right? We saw this is Tsunami turnover and it, it continues. It hasn't stopped yet. But seeing that quantified in that way really made me stop and think like, how much effort does it really take for a leader to say, hey, you know what? I appreciate you. I appreciate what you did for me today. I appreciate that you helped me get through that problem I had during that meeting. And I appreciate you having my back when you know someone came after me for forgetting this one particular thing, it doesn't take a lot of time. And it's actually not that hard and it doesn't require a lot of resources. So some of these simple ways are so effective at helping people feel that they matter and that the value that they're delivering in the workplace is more than just the sum total of their output. It's who they are as a human being and all of these different dimensions that they're bringing to the workplace that help drive that motivation and help drive and turn those outcomes. What are the barriers? Why would a smart, competent leader not do the things at work that we assume they do at home and with their family and with their friends? I assume that some of these folks who don't praise at work do certainly praise their kids when they accomplish something and they're kind to their spouse and compassionate. What changes when they walk through the doors at work or turn on a Zoom call? Maureen, I think that's a fantastic question. And it's one that I invite people to think about often, you know, either when I'm consulting or when I'm coaching, because we for so long have thought that when we walk in the door at work, 
we have to leave the personal part of ourselves outside of the door. That is just simply not true. We can't physically divide ourselves into two. We are one person and we bring all of those things into the workplace with us. I often ask people, how do you define yourself as a leader? What does that look like? And what are those behaviors that you're exhibiting in the workplace? And how do those show up at home for you? You know, you mentioned that perhaps there may be a difference between how they're showing up at work and how they're showing up at home. Sometimes that may be true, but I think more often than not, they're showing up the same way because who you are as a person has everything to do with who you are as a leader. So the values that you feel are important to you as a person, those are also the values that are going to be important to you as a leader. I had a client one time, we were talking and, you know, he was telling me how he was upset with the people at work because they weren't listening to him and they were not taking his advice and doing the things the way he thought they should be done. And just sharing with me these things that he was upset about in the workplace. So I stopped him in that moment and I said, you know, I have something I've I've observed during our time together. Would you mind if I shared that with you? He said, no, go right ahead. And so I said, well, you know, I, I feel like you're yelling at me a lot as well. So you're telling me you're yelling at the people at work, but you're yelling at me too. And I'm your coach. You're interrupting me and you're talking over me and you're doing all of these behaviors that you seem to be exhibiting in the workplace as well from what you're telling me. I said, how's that working for you? And how is that working for you at home? And this person, he sat back in his chair and I felt the energy on the call change. I noticed that he was just bawling. I said, where's the emotion coming from? What is causing that? And he said, I just realized that the way I am treating the people at work is exactly the way that I am treating my children and that I'm treating my wife. So we had conversation about that, you know, and I, well, now that you know this, you can't unknow it. So what do you want to do about that? And so that, you know, became a series of other conversations throughout the rest of our coaching time together. It's just a small example of how maybe we think that we're dividing ourselves between work and home, but really the behaviors and the actions and the beliefs that we have are those that are guiding us at work and they're also guiding us at home. It's interesting you say that because I had a client who was a yeller. He told me that his child, who was six, I think, told him, you can't yell at people at work, daddy. It's interesting that his child ended up being his best coach and his child would then say, did you yell at anyone today, daddy? (laughs) And it just (laughs) comes differently when your child says it than when I say it. But but it is (laughs) true in that instance, he was able to hear from one of the most valued people in his life, his child, stop yelling at people. Not sure how much his behavior changed, but some, yeah, it's a start. It's a start. Exactly. And I think sometimes just that awareness, oh my gosh, okay, now I'm aware of this. Now I see myself in this way that maybe I didn't see myself before. Now I have the opportunity to decide what I want to do with that awareness and how I want to shift and change if in fact that's what I want to do. And some people will go that direction and some people won't. In your book, Being Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People in Performance, you discuss the concept of human leadership. How do you see the human leadership shaping the future of leadership? I believe that human leadership is the new paradigm for our new world of work. I believe it is the leadership of the future. I believe it's the solution to the problems that we're having in organizations today from a people standpoint. And I believe it is the way forward to help organizations survive and thrive so that they exist in the next century or two. From that, I'm going to draw the conclusion that if I'm leading an organization and we are not modernizing how we lead, we risk extinction. I would agree with that. Take a look at the numbers, right? People are still shifting around. They are looking for jobs where they feel like they can contribute to a shared purpose and leverage their strengths in a way that brings to bear on that purpose. We see so often people leave jobs, not because of the organization itself, but because of the people that they're working for, their bosses. I just had a conversation this past weekend with a friend of mine, top salesperson, millions of dollars of sales in their organization for years in a row. And they ended up leaving the organization because of the challenges that they were having with this direct boss. 
And it was such a shame because this person, they didn't really want to leave. They loved what they were doing, but it didn't align with the internal values that this person held. And it didn't work for them in that way so that there was dissonance, right? And when there's that kind of dissonance, you just feel so unsettled and you feel like things just aren't aligned and they're just not working right. We are wired to seek that state of equilibrium where our internal values and our internal world matches those external values and that external world that we have around us. When that equilibrium isn't there, we will do a lot to try to find that. So this person chose to leave this organization that he'd been working in and been very successful to go to another organization that maybe wasn't as prestigious or didn't have the track record or the quality products, but yet he felt that this was a better alignment with his internal values and allowed him to show up and lean in as a leader like he wanted to and needed to be. I'll tell you a story about that also because he was telling me his first day on the job, and this is an example for you of this human leadership. He got an email from the CEO, his first day on the job at six in the morning. And the CEO's email said, I am so excited for you to be on board here. I'm so happy to have you. And I just know that you are going to knock it out of the park and do everything you can to reach that level of success that you're looking for and exceed the expectations that we have for you. When he told me that story, he was just so in awe of how this leader showed up and just demonstrated this value of we appreciate our people. You matter to us. And I'm going to show you that. I'm not just going to say it, but I'm going to show it to you in my actions and in my behaviors. Yeah, it was just a testament to his validating the decision that he had made and that it was aligned for him with his values and the organization's values. And so it's really a place where he feels like he can now thrive and survive and thrive. And he's got that internal motivators going on, right? So he wants to get up and go into work because he already feels valued by the organization. You know, I want to give the unfortunate counterpart to that. There are people we just think are jerks and you put those in one bucket, but there are also people who are just really decent people who haven't built these skills. They don't intend to be challenging, but they are. How do we help folks who want to do better move the needle in their performance? The key component of that question is how do we help folks that want to do better? So if there is that internal desire to up-level and accelerate and elevate that leadership skill, then there's an opportunity to grow in that space. And I think that's also important to bring up for your listeners, because when there isn't that desire to learn, it becomes more of a remedial kind of action. And as anyone with kids knows, how do you get kids to do something that they don't really want to do? That aside, assuming that there is an intent to develop and improve, I think that there are a couple things that we can do to help leaders elevate their skills. One is to do something like listen to this podcast, right? Take an initiative to learn something new about this area that you don't know. And sometimes that's a really hard thing for people to do, especially when they're maybe more advanced in their career and they have, you know, a certain level of proficiency already. Sometimes it's hard to take a step backwards in that way. The second thing I would do is invite people to have a beginner's mindset. What do I mean by that? Think about the last time that you tried to learn something. What did you do? You probably asked a lot of questions, right? How does that work? What do I have to do? Where do I have to start? What would you recommend? Have you tried this before and what worked well and what didn't work well? Having that beginner's mindset around starting from scratch, starting with a blank slate and asking questions to help yourself develop in the particular areas that you need to develop. And I think the third thing that people can do, we as humans learn by mimicking, right? We imitate behavior so that we learn. As babies, that's what we do. And I think when we go into the workplace, for someone who doesn't have any experience, they're like a baby in that way. They're looking at the people around them to look at the role model and look at the behaviors that they're exhibiting And they acquire those and try those on and see if they work and see how they fit and all of those things. When you're looking around you in your organization, who do you see and who do you observe that is modeling some of these behaviors that you want to get better at? 
and go up to them and ask them questions. Invite them to share what's working well for them and how did they get better at that skill? Because some of these things, as you mentioned, Maureen, they're not innate for some people. We really have to work at them. They don't come naturally. Learning what's worked well for some of the people around you gives you some data points, especially if you're you know, coming from a technical background, those data points are really helpful. Using those data points to help you understand, okay, well, I tried this in context A, B, and C, and person A told me that step one would work here, and I tried that. It didn't work. So I'm going to apply sort of the scientific method approach to this, and I'm going to iterate and apply and iterate and apply and iterate and apply and find out what that combination is for me that works well. And then when I feel like it's working well, then I'm going to go to the people that I'm interacting with and I'm going to ask them for feedback. You know, hey, like we had this conversation and I've really been working at getting better at this particular skill. How did that come across to you? Was it effective? Did it work well? What do you think I could be doing better there? Or what's another suggestion that you have for me to improve? There's a combination of things that I've talked about and how people can get improve these skills. And I think if your listeners apply just even one of those, they can start to move the needle on building out that human leader or human skill repertoire that they need in their leader toolkit to be more effective as leaders. I love the idea of selecting someone who is better than me, Mm -hmm. asking for guidance, emulating. So I'm introverted. I kind of grew up as a math science person, economics major, and was happiest behind a computer on my spreadsheets. Yes. I then went into consulting and I'm more comfortable in my area of expertise, which is not humans. And so for me learning I didn't watch The Office, but I even watched TV shows to see how people interact. When going to a networking event, I want to jump into a business conversation where I'm comfortable. I don't want to talk about a football game. They're just skills I did not have. With our clients, we talk about the mind of a scientist. We can learn the human skills just like we learned math skills or medical skills or engineering skills. If you're a good physician, you can learn to be good with humans. Yeah, I completely understand that. I'm on the introverted side as well, and people never believe that about me, but it's absolutely true. And I've had to learn how to do a lot of these things, you know, because it didn't come naturally to me and I didn't learn about these things. You know, I went into consulting as well. And one of the things you do in consulting is consulting is really about building relationships. I had to learn how to do that. Something that you said a minute ago really struck me because as scientists and technical people, there's this innate level of curiosity that you have as technical people around the world around you and about how things work and wanting to test and figure things out and try it out. And if something explodes, go back to the drawing room and try it again, right? Like that's fun. I always have thought about like the workplace is this amazing living laboratory where you can just test out things that you're observing and try them and see how it works. And those are data points for you. And if it worked well, then you can take time to reflect on that, what worked well about that, right? And write that down. If it didn't work well, what didn't work well about that and why didn't it work well? So sort of do an 8D on it and figure out like, get down to that root cause of what happened and then take those learnings and try again, go out into that laboratory, go out into the workplace the next day, go out to that meeting the next day, jump on that Zoom call the next day you'll have an opportunity to test that theory again and try it out and see what happens. A lot of the coaching clients that I work with, they are technical people. And so we've adopted that approach of this is the perfect Petri dish for you to try and go out and test some of this stuff and then bring it back and see what happens. And we'll talk about it and iterate. You'll go back out and try it again. Having that natural curiosity as scientists and technical people, you have that innately. It's maybe shifting the focus a little bit about what it is that you're curious about. But then the process and the procedure that you're going to follow and the methodology follows sort of a scientific experiment, in my opinion. I also like that you built in the feedback loop. So it's not a just, I went and did one experiment, done. Yes. It's it's iterate. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. It's so important because as human beings, we are notoriously poor at self-assessment. We know this. We overinflate our abilities and underinflate areas of opportunity. So one of the things I always like to work on with my my coaching clients, especially, is having that feedback loop and getting that. Sometimes I call it a personal board of directors. Sometimes I call it, you know, your stakeholders, whether they're internal to the organization 
whether they're external to the organization, they can be your spouse, they can be your kids, like we talked about earlier. They're great feedback providers. You know, maybe if you're in a in a financial position, maybe you want to have one of the ratings analysts be a stakeholder for you, right? That kind of example is external to the organization. But getting that feedback on a regular basis helps you then see how you're perceived through the eyes of others. As we know in the workplace, what really matters is how you're perceived in the eyes of others, because that determines if you're going to get promoted up the ladder, if that's important to you. And how well you deliver results in leading humans. What's your engagement level? What do your employees think about you? Yes. Are you that person that they all want to flee? One hack that's worked for me is I kind of consider myself an anthropologist. Humans are fascinating. (laughs) They are just fascinating. When you stand back and watch, instead of it being about me and how did I do in that conversation, just observing what people do and what they respond to is entertaining. It's why people watch reality TV. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm watching Suits right now. And it's just, it's fascinating to see like how everything works behind the scenes, like in this law office and how they interact with one another and why they do what they do and where those behaviors come from. I love reality TV because of that. It's just, I can go and study. I'm doing homework that way. And it's sort of fun, you know? We're watching the czars of Russia. Mm -hmm. Similarly, people in power, where do they take guidance? Who advises them? Wow. Impact of the advisor, the Romanovs ended up out of power and dead in part because of Rasputin giving poor guidance and them accepting it. So we do have people who are maybe more or less effective at giving the guidance are they helping us focus on our human skills, not just our technical skills? You know, we talked earlier about some of the examples of human leadership and where it's effective and what happens when you lead with that human-centered approach first. And one of the examples I'd like to share is around Alan Mulally at Ford Water Company when, you know, he turned around the organization. So when he came into the organization, the engagement level at employees was around 40%. And when he left, the engagement rate was at 93%. If you look at the stock price when Alan took over the company from Bill to the day that he left, it was around a 1,837% increase in stock price. I often get people that ask me, well, is human leadership really effective? Like, isn't it soft and fluffy and this woo-woo kind of stuff? That's not really how I want to lead because I'm a technical person and I want to drive results and I want to get that performance. And You know, I want to deliver those outcomes that the organization is looking for and rating me on and evaluating me by. And I often will share that example because Alan isn't the only one who has used these kinds of principles to get those kinds of results. There are many others. Look at Hubert Jolie at Best Buy. Look at Indra Nui at Pepsi. Look at Kent Taylor at Texas Roadhouse. There's so many different examples of when you use these kinds of techniques and examples that it does result in those numbers that you're looking for, it does actually drive results. But you put the people first to do that, and that requires a different mindset, and it requires a different skill set. And that, I think, is partly what we're talking about here today. Is Smokey Bones, we interviewed their CHRO talking about what they did during the pandemic to keep their employees as whole as possible. And they were creative in doing things like selling employees food at wholesale, because they paid wholesale. So so what are the basic needs? We don't have many customers. So how do we allow our employees to be as healthy and whole as they can be and still remain profitable? And it did require different thinking and a different level of care. It seems like the pandemic created a lot of opportunities because we are seeing people's living rooms. We see their kids and their cats and their dogs. And yet, Many people seem to have wanted to go back to what was more comfortable and may have lost a little bit of what was gained during COVID. And we continue to see that. We still have CEOs of super large companies saying, oh, you know what, this whole like remote work from home thing. Yeah, we're done with that. You need to be back in the office. And it's a mandate. And it doesn't matter that productivity levels and performance were actually higher during the pandemic. With that, it doesn't seem to matter. And so to me, that indicates a couple things. One is that the pull of status quo is so strong 
that we want things to go back to normal. We want that level of comfort. We want that level of psychological safety that we had when the world was as we knew it. And we were able to lead in the way that we were most comfortable with because it didn't require us to have to adopt anything new in terms of behavior or mindset or actions. That is something that when we think about human leadership and we think about how do we implement that, it's an important question of, are you ready to go on this journey that's going to require you to think differently, to challenge your thinking, to challenge the status quo, and to allow you to show up in a different way as a leader? I call it leadership by design in one of my workshops. You know, what is this leadership that you want to show up as? And what is your identity as that leader? Because that is going to shift and change. It's no longer about you as command and control and having the last word and having all the answers. It's about the evolving role of a leader moving into that coaching and facilitating role to help people become that best version of themselves and tap into those motivators that they have. They are intrinsically powered to get up in the morning and do the work that they're so excited to do because they stoked that internal fire. Having that mindset of curiosity and having that mindset of a learner and understanding what makes people tick and understand what drives their behavior. Who are they outside of work? Are they a mother or father, a brother, sister, daughter? Do they have children or elderly parents that they're caring for? Like, what are some of the things that they are facing? Do they want to buy a house? What are the things that you can tap into and help them work towards and then stoke that motivation to help them deliver? I hear and I see regularly folks who were successful in the pre-COVID world want to go back and think they can. And if they own companies, they'll be able to most likely attract people who want that environment and want that world. Yes. And now we're in a competition between people who want the mostly work from the office world versus those who want either hybrid or work from home. How do we help people in both environments choose human-centered I'm assuming folks who aren't choosing it have also read an article. They've heard the statistics. They're not uninformed, but they're not choosing to change. Do you just not work with them and wait till something blows up? Or is there a way to help folks gain more comfort with being human-centered? I think that's a great question. And it's one that I often think about. From a coaching standpoint, for example, if an organization has said, look, this person needs to be fixed, they have certain things that are broken, if you will, and we want to make sure that they're going to get fixed. So we're going to send them to get a coach and we're going to assign them a coach and then they have to work with this coach and get better. That is a mindset and a culture in an organization that doesn't often lead to success for a coaching outcome. Because what's going to happen is the person that you're coaching is going to change maybe. And then you're going to put them back in a system that is still status quo. And the system that is status quo, when it observes and feels and experiences an outlier, what does it do? It ejects the outlier. So there isn't a lot of opportunity in that way to change behavior or change thinking or change mindset because the environment around them didn't shift. I have a story in my book about John, who is this typical leader who yells at people and has a typical command and control style. He's finding that he's losing people left and right because they don't want to work on his team anymore. So they are jumping ship because they feel they don't matter and they're not valued and appreciated. And John doesn't understand why his leadership isn't effective anymore because his behaviors haven't changed, but the environment around him has changed. And so that dissonance, like we mentioned earlier, when there's that dissonance, things aren't going to work well. We may have a contingent of leaders and organizations who decide we're going to stay status quo. We don't want any of this new world kind of stuff. We're going to lead like we were before COVID. We're going to handle people like we did before, and we're just going to carry on. And I'll be very interested to see what happens with those organizations. Do they survive or not? There may be some that do and likely some that don't. I think it's always a choice. We have a choice of if we want to change and grow or if we want to stay the same. Like Maya Angelou says, when we know better, then we do better. 
I think it's a really important point that if someone is, quote, sentenced to coaching, if they're coming into alignment with an organization whose systems and processes are also more human centered, the probability of success is higher. If they are sentenced to coaching because they yell more often than the other yellers in the hallway, then they are unlikely to successfully change and they're going to be angry. (laughs) Why am I stuck getting this coaching thing that I didn't want when everyone else gets away with behaving badly? If they improve, the probability of exits high. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was working on the research for my doctoral work, I interviewed organizations to find out, like, what do they think about coaching? You know, what what's the perception of coaching? And for 80% of the organizations that I talked with, they perceived coaching as remedial. It was required to be on the checklist from HR before they fired somebody. That perception of coaching as performance-based rather than coaching for compassion or coaching for improvement or coaching for elevating skills and using it as a perk to attract high talent to the organization, there was a vast distinction between that in these organizations. And sometimes that's also why some of these efforts fail because you have that different mindset, you have that different culture. And like you said, when you have those two groups and those two camps, when something isn't fitting well in either one of those, it tends to go elsewhere. I didn't know the statistic 80%, but I do have clients who've said, you know, so-and-so put in my performance appraisal improved during coaching, which should be a positive statement. But her point was the fact that coaching was referenced in her appraisal was the dog whistle to say, she's a problem. Yes. So if you were a problem and you got better, you're still a problem. And unfortunately, that mindset that does exist in some organizations. And unfortunately, there are a lot of HR departments that use that as a check the box to cover themselves before they let someone go. Just for the record, I don't work with organizations who have chosen to have people go through coaching because they need to be fixed. I only work with organizations who see coaching as a a perk to develop and encourage their high talented and successful employees to continue to grow and evolve. We do it largely as part of leadership development programs in which we're developing a cohort of people and we're helping them change the systems and processes so that as they evolve and grow, they're actually changing their own environment to support evolution and growth, not to get punished for growing. If you outgrow the system, At some point, if the system doesn't change, you're creating an auto exit plan for your most talented people. Yes. I don't know that we talk enough about the intersection between human development and system change, but as you are helping organizations take on a human-centered leadership approach, do you have guidance for the organization so the hard work you've done to help people change their leadership is aligned with how the organization is also running? Mm -hmm. One of those factors is right at the beginning when I'm understanding why are they bringing me in? Is it coaching as a punishment or is it coaching for the elevating their skill set? That's the very first thing. The second thing is having that group of feedback providers So involving more people in the organization in that process of helping that person change and grow and evolve. And so when that happens, there's a ripple effect because those people are seeing, oh, wow, this is really having an effect. And this is having a positive effect on the top line, on the bottom line, on the engagement rates, on the processes and procedures that we're putting in place that help people in the organization perform. So when they start to see that, it becomes this ripple effect throughout the organization. And the third thing is around what is the tone from the top? What is happening at the top? Are they supportive of this effort? Do they even know that it's happening? It's speaking to the culture of the organization and what message is the top sending around these efforts to help grow and evolve people? And how is that included in the culture, which is part of that system? Do you advise the senior leaders how to make sure they are sending the right message? I do a lot of work around culture and around organizations defining what they want their structure and systems and strategy to look like and how does the culture support that or hinder that. And so the messaging of 
what we want to achieve and how we're going to achieve that and what we think about, those are often topics that I advise on. It makes perfect sense that you can't change the humans in the system and expect a different outcome if you're not also changing the system. There's a great example of that. You know, so when Alan came into Ford, there was a lot of infighting at Ford. There was a lot of siloed type of activity. There wasn't a lot of cross-functional. There wasn't a lot of communication. Alan came up with this playbook essentially for employees around how are we going to be as an organization? What does that vision look like? And he got it onto, you know, the size of an employee badge. We had the badge, but we also had this little card that fit onto the badge. And so you put it on the same little chain that you had on with your badge. And everyone carried this card around. And on the one side, it said Ford, you know, and it said one, and it had just filled out what was one. And then on the back, it had the behaviors that were expected in this organization that he was leading that were meant to shift the culture so that everyone understood what the expected behaviors were what the principles and practices were and how those were going to play out and that everyone was expected to adhere to those behaviors. And there was zero tolerance for not adhering to those behaviors. And so, for example, if you were in a meeting and, you know, one of the behaviors was like, we listen to each other, we respect each other. And so if you were in a meeting and there was a sidebar conversation going on, and I'm sure we've all been in those meetings, right, where people are having those little back and forth and there's multiple ones going on. Well, you as the leader would stop the meeting and it would be silent. And once the people having the sidebar conversation would realize that, oh, everything else in the room had stopped and everyone was looking at them, they would most of the time stop talking. And up on the wall, there were the behaviors listed, right? So you would point that this is how we are interacting with one another. This person isn't being heard because you're having this conversation. Can we continue? And so it was a consistent tacking back to those behaviors that were identified as this is setting the new culture and tone for the organization. That's just an example of how you can start to shift the culture by identifying what those expected behaviors are, the principles and practices of the organization so that everyone understands them and everyone adheres to them. And Alan would often say, like, if people didn't want to adhere to those behaviors because they wanted to status quo right? They wanted to go back to the old political environment. They wanted the, you know, not sharing, no collaboration, you know, not listening to one another. If they wanted to go back to that, that was perfectly fine. But it seemed like they were going to need to find a new place to work to do that. And so they would self-select out and it was brilliant and it worked. We see that in the results that he achieved while he was there. We see that in the engagement rates. I love the missing piece because a lot of organizations have core principles and they have them on cards and people have read them. The example of how you and he and the team close the loop between you're not adhering to our principles and creating the expectation that we all shift is the brilliant piece. How did Alan and the team get people to live it rather than it was an email? Alan is a leader who leads by example. He roles models that behavior, first and foremost. Alan shifted so many different things about how things worked at Ford. And I think one of the key things he did was he invited in people to attend the weekly BPR meeting, which was the business process review. So every week he'd have people attending as guests in this room to observe the behaviors that were being exhibited by the people around the table that were these new behaviors that everyone is expected to adhere to. Those behaviors would play out at the table. So for example, there was a meeting one day where you know there was a problem with a liftgate issue in Oakville, Canada. And the person who was responsible for that was showing that they had a status on the report and it was read. The challenge was that there needed to be trust established between the people at the table. Instead of the old infighting in politics and jockeying for position, there needed to be a collaboration of people to work together and figure out how do we help this person who's having this liftgate issue on the vehicle solve that problem because it, w- it needed to be cross-functional. There were so many different pieces involved. There were a couple of weeks that went by where, you know, that was still not resolved. And as soon as Alan said, look, you know, this person has this problem. How can we help him with this problem? And then one person that was leading a different division said, oh, I've seen that problem before. 
I have some data on that. I can get you that data and we can look at that and take a look at it. And this other person who was running a different division said, oh, well, I've got some engineers that I can just like send out to that location in Oakville and they can be hands-on and give us some data in the field and come back and we can get some more data and figure out how to fix that. All of a sudden, you start to have people that are starting to interact together when they hadn't done that before in that way. And they started to trust one another because they understood that to succeed, they all needed to work together and they all needed to have that kind of trust. It was amazing because as soon as they solved that problem and they saw that the person who said, oh my gosh, I have this problem, didn't get fired. They didn't shoot the messenger because that's what would have happened before. The person was still there. They were still alive. And lo and behold, like they solved the problem and vehicles started flowing all around the world again. That person stayed. And then the trust started building because they saw that, oh, these behaviors were now demonstrated in front of them and they saw it working and they saw what the results could be. And all of the people that were guests in the room saw what was happening at the leader level, right? So now they are going to go back and they are going to role model and mimic that behavior that they just saw. And so it was a brilliant way of taking that at the leadership level. And even though it's written on the wall and written on the badge, it came alive in that way. And it rippled throughout the organization all the way down to the top floor. And it was brilliant in how that worked. Making it visible and making it real and tangible in a way that people can see and touch and feel helped people realize that this is how you can affect culture change. And it doesn't just become something that sits on a wall, like one of those inspirational posters that, you know, so many organizations have, you know, or that they profess to believe in. It actually becomes how we work together and what we do to drive the results that we're looking for. I love the example. One of our regular contributors, Greg Moran, was the chief strategy officer at that time. And he talks a lot about just the idea that Alan showed up to those meetings every week. Yes. right. It wasn't like, you people go figure this out. And he said the cost of the people in that room and that they were dedicated every single week, they showed up and they were prepared and they engaged in fixing, not telling or pontificating was a huge shift as well. How we are as leaders, how we treat each other and just where we choose to show up and the activities we engage in when we're there make a huge impact on everyone who sees it. And the rumors, people talk. Yes, and you know the conversations around those water coolers shifted during those years more, I would say, compassionate and demonstrating curiosity about others rather than this infighting and the political games that were played and the jockeying for position. And One of the statistics I think is important as we think about changing culture and changing systems is often during a significant change, about a third of the workforce can turn over. I have seen that with senior leaders. When we say we're going to change our culture, there are people who opt out and they should. Again, decent human beings someplace else. And the idea that when we see that turnover, it's something that could be an indication of success, not failure. Right. Exactly. I have a story in my book that I also talk about where, you know, this person was in the Navy and he was working on a ship and he got on the ship and he encountered one of the worst environments that he's ever encountered. The morale was super low. People had been working in lock shift, which was like this intense schedule of inhumane hours that people were expected to work for days on end. There was an incident that happened on the ship, and then they decided to take off the commander and put in a new commander. And so when the new commander came in, he made it a point to walk around the entire ship, introduce himself to every single person, shake their hand, and thank them for what they were doing. That was the first thing this person did. And then he asked everyone to share with them what was working well, what wasn't working well, right? Doing some diagnosis and getting some data. And he went away, he created a vision of what he wanted the ship's culture to be like. And then he came back and he shared it with everyone on the ship. He had his direct reports come in and he said, look, he had 12 of them. He said, look, this is how we're going to behave from now on. This is the vision that I have for this ship. People are going to respect each other. They're going to keep their quarters clean. They're going to pick up after themselves in their work locations, you know, where they were working on the ship. They're going to treat each other with decency. There won't be any joking around behind other people's backs and so on, right? So he created this clear vision of what he wanted that he saw that could be possible for the ship. There were 3,500 people on the ship. When he had this meeting with his direct reports, he said, now, 
this is what I expect of you. And I expect you to turn around and share this with your direct reports. And if you can't do this, then I want you to tell me that and you need to leave. And so he did that. And of the 12 people that he had working for him, four of them chose to leave because they didn't want to operate in that new environment in that way for whatever reason, you know, what? We still love you, like Alan says, and we wish you all the best as you look for that next opportunity for yourself. But the ship's commander had the same approach. If you don't want to do this, that's fine, but you're going to have to find somewhere else where you're going to be a better fit. The story goes on and within 96 hours or 72 hours, I can't remember right now what I said in the book, they had gotten to every single person on the ship, all 3,500 people, so that every single person understood what this cultural shift was what the system dynamic was that they were now going to be operating in, and what was expected of them. This person says by the time they stepped off the ship to go to their next assignment, the ship had completely turned around. Morale was the highest it had ever been, and they accomplished the dry dock repairs in the least amount of time that anyone had ever done it. So it's just another example of how like, when you set the tone at the top and you create what the expected behaviors are and the principles and practices. And you share that throughout the organization and it's very clear to people what the new behaviors are. You have either that automatic self-selection out, the opt-out, the attrition, and that's fine because if the people aren't able to operate in that new environment, we love them, but we want them to go find a place that fits better for them. And the people that are left, now it creates the conditions for those people to really come together and drive that performance forward. And you don't have people resenting the other people who aren't adhering to the culture or people resenting people who are not getting punished, if you will, for things that they are not adhering to in the new culture, right? It seems like the true sign that we're taking this seriously is a few people opt out. Yes. You know, I think it's a good indicator of the effectiveness of the communication and what was shared. I think it's also actually, as I think about that for a second, I think it's also a good indicator of people realizing that the values that they hold or like their internal GPS, as I talk about in the book, may or may not be aligned with the new direction and the new culture and the new operating behaviors and practices of that culture. Jennifer, thank you. I love your stories and what your book talks about. Can you remind our listeners of the name of your book and where to reach you? Certainly. The name of my book is Be Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People and Performance. It's available at Amazon or wherever you prefer to purchase your books. If they want to know more about me or find out more about me, they can go to my website, which is drdrjennifernash.com. Jennifer, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. And thank you to our listeners. We hope that Jennifer's insights and experience will help you become a future-ready leader. Thank you so much, Maureen, for having me. Thank you. Thank you.